Okay, thank you very much, uh, Slavo, and uh, as always, you've been both uh, challenging and apocalyptic. So I love a, this. A brilliant, a brilliant performance. I know. No, no, no. But you perform. Now you let saying, let so me read what he said. Yeah. As always, oh, yeah, you yeah, were. Yeah, it yeah, means yeah. I was selling the yeah. same bullshit as usual. <laughs> you were, you were challenging. But you know what in politically correct terminology challenge means. Challenge, you know, like yeah, weight yeah, challenge, you're brain you're challenge. challenge. You're I want yeah. challenge. No, yeah. So thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Slavoj. Um, is giving another talk later today. Perhaps a few of you are going at the Royal uh, Society for the Arts. But there, I will talk purely about economy. <laughs> purely about economy. I will attack the idea of basic income. Yeah. As a basically a right-wing dream. Excellent. Good. Okay. I just want to create new enemies. I don't <laughs> have enough enemies. Yet. Another challenging idea. So, but he's accepted to uh, answer questions or points or and so on for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So please, could you? Uh, show yes. your hands. Uh, start there, yes. Uh, take two. We'll take two and then... Uh, the two sorry. examples you gave what you call the, this technological rupture were both things which are not new. You talked about these brainwave panics, but armies can create panics by, you know, bombing people and uh, and so forth. But, you know, the phenomenon of panic is a view. The other example was wiping memories, and yet all these CIA 60s experiments in Canada, which named the talked about at the beginning, you know, this is new too, so I don't see where the technological... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please, I'm sorry. Technology creates a new mode of resistance, and just this morning I was reading about these hackers who have exposed the, the, you know, these scientists at UEA for uh, all their dodgy practices, and, and, you know, hacking seems to be a version of resistance, let's say, which is created by this technological rupture, so I'm, I'm not sure what... I know you have a... No, 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 at the end, okay, sorry. It that these are not ruptures. Uh, you know in what sense they are? One thing is to create panic through bombarding the media, sorry, to bombarding your external sensory apparatus, like I, but what is new for me in what they are doing is that nothing happens in reality. You are just directly bombarded by what is usually the effect of panic. For me, sorry, this is a revolution. You know, it's like, for example, and to go back to your topic, not mine, sexuality, it's like if I take a pill which directly, without any I think they even exist, I was told already, they play with this, a kind of directly causing orgasm without any sensory input and achieving the orgasm in the normal way. I mean, I claim there is a big difference, you know, and so again, your example bombs is for me this, and sorry, which was your other example, the, the nothing hackers, new? The hackers, the hackers. No, 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 not the hackers, another example of this. So yeah. Ah, here again, you know, generally it was done in this ridiculous Manjurian candidate way and so on. The point is again that now it's done in a precise, direct way. It's none of this behavioral hypnosis stuff and so on. It's they literally try to focus on the part of your brain and do it there. It, it is, it has this... All, as far as I know, again, all the previous examples were done in some kind of a, with some kind of a primitive Pavlovian shocks, whatever. It was, again, okay. it went through your right. senses. Yeah. Now, the idea is we work directly on your brain. We take, we directly materialize thought. Sorry, I think as to hackers, I, I totally, I, I simply totally agree with you. Although, you know, uh, how to put it? Uh, I always have this problem. Yes, it's very nice, the image, you know, hackers subverting, uh, disclosing, and so on. But I have a totally naive problem. For me, this is just still too close to the model of resistance, in the sense of there are up there bad guys in power, and we try to disrupt it. I agree, but at some point I want to be up there. If not me, okay. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, to put it in less uh, stupid terms, I'm criticizing myself. I would like, I think we owe to humanity, not just hackers, but a viable alternate model. Yeah, okay. Ah, you, we move to the left or right. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a right impression. Um, on the one hand, you say we should hold on to the secular modernity project and not let us be seduced by postmodern myth of there are no yeah. narratives anymore. Yeah. Fine. On the other hand, you're saying that the fascism where the fundamentalism is a symptom of liberal involvement in certain areas of the world. But weren't those liberal in, uh, interventions in, say, Afghanistan or Iraq just an attempt 
to, like you say, spread secular modernity in parts of the world that are not secular and modern. You also, with the example of Afghanistan, you mentioned the left-wing party that somehow waned out. I mean, wasn't the attempt with Benjamin to make a revolution in order to, to prevent the fascism, weren't those left-wing attempts also Western interventions in a way, in, in the sense of the project of a secular modernity? Basically, basically, on the one hand, there should be there should be a secular modernity involvement in the whole. You hold on to the universal project. On the other hand, you say the symptom of that has been fundamentalism. The, my solution is here a very clear one. The problem is this one. I agree with your description, but the problem is this one. Is this already, to put it very naively, the truth of modernity? Can here I? respectfully disagree with some of the post-colonialists who basically claim the project of Western modernity is ultimately just a Western project, if even inherently linked to, it depends on how far you go, to imperialist expansion, whatever. I claim no. I claim, and here I'm an old-fashioned Eurocentric, I admit it. I claim that, uh, that uh, in all these cases of United States and so on and so on, that to put it very naively, the problem is not that they were too modernists trying to impose and so on. Here I agree with Habermas, but against Habermas. They were, not, they were not modern enough. And the price we pay is in what? Is in, this would be my answer, that uh, if you look closely at this so much celebrated post-modern return, post-secular return of the religious, it's no longer the old authentic, if it was ever authentic, religious. It's already, you know, it's no longer what we once called the imposed way of life. It's reinvented, it's a kind of a choice and so on. It's something totally different, which is why I claim, I agree, let's go to Afghanistan. How? What is modern enough? Uh, Taliban. Taliban are extremely modern, not in their ideology, but in the very centralized sense of how they establish power and so on. Taliban are, my God, I'm not even saying anything general. Taliban, forget about their ideology. Look at how they function. If there is something which has absolutely nothing to do with any ancient Arab tradition and so on, is, is the Taliban. It's the same in the United States, I claim. Look at all these crazy survivalists, fundamentalists, and so on and so on. I don't see them as, I don't see them, my problem with fundamentalists, it's not that they are fundamentalists. There are authentic fundamentalists. I don't doubt they are in, uh, they are in, uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan, in the United States, but, but definitely knows those, those neo-Christian freaks. Pat Robertson, Jimmy Swaggart, all those nice guys, they are for me not fundamentalists. They are extremely individualist media manipulators who stage their fundamentalism as another me individualist media spectacle and so on and so on. Now, but I will give you my dream, nonetheless, is not we, Europe, should become everything. I claim, which is why I wrote a text, which, another text which brought me some enemies, for example, Probably you know it, I was even talking about the last time here. Where I totally identify is the Musavi wing this, who lost the elections there. Because what I appreciate there is that, you know my story, it, how the West was perplexed. Either they read Musavi as just, uh, uh, as, uh, oh, it's another of these pro-Western reformists, <laughs> or, oh, it's just inner struggle, Obama, unfortunately, but maybe he said this for tactical reasons. He said, they are not, not any greater friends of the United States. They didn't see that for me. The, way, the reason I was fascinated was that, in a way, you know how fashionable it is to mock Michel Foucault? She crazy. Who, this is the material proof that it was more than a fundamentalist takeover in the Iranian revolution. There was something, an authentic, democratic, however you call it, emancipatory explosion. This is for me, in a way, the return of the repressed there. And there I see no need for any kind of we, the Western people, coming to enlighten them and so on and so on. Again, as I always emphasize, my universalism is the universalism of struggle. It's not we come to teach Iranians. It's that there, for the first time, okay, one of the few times I found, that's what I like in Iran, a movement which is a genuine movement from there, but which 
at the same time, I have no problems of identifying with them. And that's my formula of universalism. Universalism of struggle, not this bullshitting UNESCO stuff, oh, what a nice Iranian culture, screw them, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> what I'm interested in, they have a struggle, we have the struggle, can we establish a line of solidarity or, of struggles? But... But Musavi said, need a secular no modern. He was prime minister in the 80s. Yeah, anyway. Oh, he has to save the country. I respect him for that because the 80s was where the darkest moment of the West. We all know what happened. Saddam, this was for me the scandal, admit it. Namely, when Saddam attacked Iraq, we all knew what oh, yeah. happened. He thought it's weakness there, let's grab part of land. Not only the United States supported him, also uh, it was still alive, this Yugoslavia-led non-aligned movement. They all were silently with, with Saddam. It was the most, and what I, to add insult to injury, I wrote about it. You remember when Saddam was put to trial? His greatest crime, in simple qualitative terms, his greatest crime was, uh, of course, the attack on Iran. Millions died and so on. You know that it wasn't even although Iran demanded in the list of a, what a strange trial where you abstract of the greatest crime of the person and so on. As to this, is he, uh, you know, I have, as people know, nothing against uh, religion as such. I claim Islam is a very interesting thing. On the one hand, you have potential Islamofascists, blah, blah. On the other hand, it deeply fascinates me the notion of Ummah, as, you know, I wrote about it, my idea comes for that Fatty Ben Slama, the French guy. This idea in Islam, as he emphasizes, is in contrast to Jewish and Christian religion, it's a non-family religion, a religion of orphans. Already Mohammed was an orphan and so on. So the problem of Uma is how to establish a new community without this, you know, uh, hierarchy that you rely on and so on. I see in this a tremendous potential. I don't find any, I, as I saw yesterday, I was, I, was, I, I, I was with the terrorists, bad joke, at Al Jazeera, a debate, and we debated should Turkey be allowed, blah, blah. I said if Musavi won, not Turkey, Iran should be allowed in European Union, if Mu <laughs> Musavi wins. I know what you mean, of course he's religious, blah, blah, green. But first, things are not as simple as that. I have my spies there, people. You know that Musavi has a slight conflict with his wife. His wife, <laughs> I'm not kidding. His wife is a Foucauldian. He reads but you and me. So <laughs> give it some time. Give it some time. Okay, okay, give it okay. some time. <laughs> um, I hope you see that my, my point is a question for clarification. Yeah. Not as crudely pedantic as it may seem, mm -hmm. but the phrase that you used when you talked about um, when you speak about celebrating alienation, yeah. um, I suppose my difficulty with that phrase is it is an associative one. It's a semantic association with Bagwan of all people who talked about celebrate contradiction. And my my question for for yeah. clarification really is, I suppose, to raise the idea, which I'm sure is the case that um, the, the alienation is very specific and not to be confused. And the celebration also is, is a particular, and perhaps not the best term, in my opinion, because what you have to avoid at all times is any confusion with the descent into the kind of postmodern morass, amoeba of, of lack of commitment and rigor. In that area, yeah, that is where the fault. Yeah, yeah. You no, but it's we, where the fault yes, is, yes, as yes, you yes. said. No, but I think it's. I, necessary. I agree with you. I just, nonetheless. The, re the reason I risk, not so much celebration, we can debate about that, but the reason I risk the term as a positive example, alienation, is as a counter notion to any temptation of, uh, of uh, community or let's all get together and so on and so on. My idea is that, is that we should maybe, I'm, we should maybe accept the fact that, how should I put it, uh, uh, that no, 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 yeah, 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 no, 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 I don't like, again, I agree here with you, this is too postmodern, let's to celebrate the gap and so on. What I'm, what I'm simply saying is that, uh, uh, okay, I'll put it in these simple terms, it's very elementary. Look, when we speak about language, no, the standard phenomenological genesis is to read contemporary 
purely ritualized, without content forms, as, as they put it, sedimentations of something which originally was full of meaning, like we shake hands. Originally it meant I don't have whatever. I think one of the theories is that you did this to show the enemy that you don't have, I mean, you had a knife in, with the other hand in the bag, the knife, no? But I don't, I, I don't, I think this is a false topic. I don't think we should, we should read it as a fall. For me, if there is anything truly great about humanity, is we should celebrate cliches, for example. Yeah, for example, my hero here is, you must know, if you like movies, uh, uh, the great philosopher producer uh, Samuel Goldwyn. You know, once, you know, this legend, his, uh, pro his, uh, uh, he was criticized, he got a memo, uh, there are too many old cliches in your films. You know, then he wrote quickly a memo to his scenario writers, please, we need quickly new cliches. <laughs> Absolutely, I agreed. When something becomes a cliché, you know, we should drop all this phenomenological idea of, oh, it's just a sedimentation of an authentic moment. No, this sedimentation creates the space for freedom. It is in clichés that we are able, precisely when something becomes a cliché, it also opens up the space to think it in a different way and so on and so on. But I sincerely, not just kind of a, a opportunism, I see your point, but I often get seduced into, you know, all this my famous, which will be when politically correct people will shoot me red as an accusation, you know, all these my statements like the problem with Hitler was that he wasn't violent enough and so on, you know. But I like, I think you should first kick the guy to awaken him and then comes the theory, you know, but yeah. they don't listen to the theory, you don't kick the guy brutally with your feet into his head, no? But on the same point, and in, in reference to what we said here earlier, I think that in that what the hell do you call it, that space, yeah. is, is the gap that opens between uh, knowledge and information. And I think the, the thing to do is to avoid at all costs thinking, if we're dealing with information, we have to quickly get to knowledge. But instead, accept that as a, a process. And no, at least I deeply agree with you here, and this is the point that I often make, even apropos politics. I'm not sure that I got you correctly, but for example, there are people today, my God, this sounds as if I'm denouncing them, but they are my friends. You know? uh, like Chomsky, even up to a point, uh, Jameson, who think we live in a totally, uh, uh, totally okay. cynical era, and the point is not knowledge, we just have to give information to tell people. No, I think this is fatally wrong. More than ever, probably, we live today in ideology. I claim that even, I will develop a little bit of this tomorrow at LSE, there, one should go to the basket of the enemies too. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, that even, you know how we have even this, how should I call it, uh, se um, semantic overburdening with the ideology. Look, my God, you cannot buy a simple cup of coffee without, as they inform you with Starbucks, helping the poor in Guatemala, caring for our environment. I'm almost tempted to say that a proper left re response is, please forget about the starving children, the new community. I just want a fucking cup of coffee, you know? Like, like you know, we, if anything, again, we have this semantic over overdrive, which, again, I hope you will agree with me, is precisely why is ideology so difficult to beat today? Because it's literally experience as its own opposite. Let me give you the last example here. Did you see, I didn't, but I talk about them. I'm a Hegelian, I don't need reality. Any of these two Israeli films, uh, uh, Waltz with Bashir or Lebanon, they're for me ideology at its purest. Of course, they are better than some direct military, but you know what's ideology? It's this withdrawal to simple human experience. You know what's the trick with Lebanon? It's just most of the film takes place, I think, within a tank, and the idea is forget about dirty politics. Look how horrible a thing it is to be a soldier in a war, all the fears and so on. But I claim precisely this withdrawal to simple human suffering allows you to abstract from the entire historical context. Okay, okay, they were suffering, Israelis. Oh, everyone was suffering, Lebanon and so on. But the point is what they were doing there. And you don't get at that by identifying with the guy within a tank. Because the point of being in the tank in a panic is precisely that you don't think at that point. 
And that's the ideology of these movies. By, by focusing on this immediate experience of horror, which sounds very deep, like, let's not forget beyond all political manipulations, how, what a horrible thing, it's war. Yeah, but that's why we should think. It's not enough to present this immediate point of suffering. No, that's why you see, to see ideology there, it's the problem today. I claim more and more ideology is masked today exactly as this opposite, as a return to, like, let's call it ordinary human experience. A very last question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Oh. <coughs> Are you extreme right or left? Eh? No, yeah. I think he is left. I think I ne never got it. Do you measure it from the home or from the <laughs> it's, it's, it's my left. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I like what you're saying about the opposite. The problem, my problem, and I think thanks for bringing up the Israeli example, yeah. is that when you talk about Israel and Palestine, you have two opposites. Now I want to read you uh, the Jew and the but I want to read something you wrote in 2006. I think it's the parallax view, and if just if you can clarify, because it, yeah. I think it's very interesting, but yeah. you don't yeah. expand on it. Yeah. So <clears throat> you yourself contrast uh, conspiracies of the Holocaust and the wild, wild, wild-eyed Muslim, and you know exactly what you're saying now. That the symptom of its opposite, and you write like this: said the truly enigmatic feature is how these two thoroughly op opposed views can coexist in, in a public space. It is possible to claim at the same time that anti-Semitism is all, per all pervasive again in, in its postmodern version and that Muslims continue to function as the figure of the cultural racial other. Where in, the, where in this position is the truth, definitely not in any kind of middle ground of avoiding two extremes, one should rather assert the truth of both extremes, co conceiving each of, each of the two as the symptoms of its opposite. So I think it's really interesting that I don't really understand what you're, what you're actually saying. <laughs> uh, no, what I, what, no, what I, uh, first, uh, here we are dealing with a very specific problem, and let me give you, okay, what you are, were quoting there, I'm sorry you got, you got me now, but I think it would have been possible to defend it, but to make my position, I would like to be here shamelessly open, even if I create new enemies. First, uh, I, and I wrote about it in that text published in Guardian, Slicing the West, and so on. All my sympathies with Palestinians. At the same time, I, 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 I don't buy, I have this in my new book, Tragedy and Farce, you know, I don't buy the logic of temporarily we should allow for a little bit of anti-Semitism, you know, they just, they really mean the Zionist state when some Arabs use anti-Semitic terminology and so on. No, this is for me, the, it doesn't work in that way, unfortunately, because the illusion here is that today, today they think the Jew is the enemy, sooner or later they will see it's really the capitalism. No, that later moment will never come. That's my theory. But okay, let me tell you another thing. You know what would be would have been the first step to do there? And I will go through my friend Udi Aloni soon to Israel to preach before they throw me out, whatever. The first thing to do is that I think, and don't laugh at me, that to leave the awareness, self-esteem of both sides, that they are basically much more civilized than they appear. And uh, if you, for example, compare them with the war in my ex-country, Yugoslavia, I spoke with many Western journalists who told me we thought Middle East is the horror. My God, this is high civilization, I mean, compared to the incredible, breathtaking brutality in the post-Yugoslav war. Things were done serially there, like, you know, cutting balls to prisoners, they had to swallow their penis, to eat their, uh, to swallow their eyes. But I don't even want to go in detail about it. So, uh, first, they are not as bad as that. We Europeans can be much worse when we get a little bit dynamic. The second <laughs> thing, the second thing I am tempted to say is that uh, my advice to the Israelis is a very simple one. I sympathize with you. It's not as simple as that. I agree that there is, uh, 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 how to put it, uh, sometimes if you read leftist texts, it looks as if, how to put it, su the suffering of Palestinians is the greatest suffering in the world today and so on. But you know what would be good for the Israelis? 
I, it shocked me. I read some sources, not from any Arabs, from Israeli documentation itself, to look at how they, Israelis themselves, their leaders, Ben Gurion, Dayan, were presenting the situation till 67. It's breathtaking how honest they were. For example, uh, I have it, I'm sorry, I don't have it here. You know, when in a kibbutz near Gaza, just after or before, I don't know, 56 war, uh, uh, an Israeli soldier came close, no, sorry, some Arabs sneaked out of Gaza, sorry for this racist already terms, and tried to steal some food from kibbutz land just across the border. An Israeli soldier went there, tried to, tried to, tried to, 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 tried chase to, to chase them away, and then they kidnapped him, and next day they delivered the body, the Arabs, to the United Nations with all his eyes out. Of course, immediately, all this mythology of Samson, the gates, or Gaza, or whatever. But what's interesting is the following. The next day, at the burial of this guy, Moshe Dayan, 56, hold a speech, which is an incredible speech. It says, my God, I'm so sorry, maybe I will quote it tomorrow. To you. It says, we Israelis have absolutely no right to blame the Arabs. He says this in 56. He says, we take from them something which was still recently their land. No problem here. Our task is not to chase them as criminals, but and then, surprisingly, you would have thought, let's recognize our responsibility. Then he does something very strange and put it in a simple, amoral, military conflict. We have a war to win, and our task is to fight for it. Like, with, he basically says it's a war without justification. They want it. We want it. It's nonetheless, I think, much more refreshing than all this stuff which predominates now, you know, of how Israel is right. You know, as my friend Udi Aloni says, you know, Israeli, I like this about them, the most atheist nation in the world, I think. The, and, but nonetheless, you know, this fetishist denial, je sais bien, mais quand même. Their logic is, there is no God, but nonetheless, God gave us the land, no, and so on, it's ours. No. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, I know this is a totally crazy position, and it's probably a utopia. But it starts to attract me, not in any way in an anti-Semitic way. Again, my friend Udi Aloni convinced me, you know, this idea of a binational one state, usually it is dismissed as total utopia. Are you crazy? They hate each other and so on. Well, what if the two-state solution is really a utopia? Isn't it strange that we all accept the two-state solution as the only realistic one, but are we aware that nobody wants it there? Israel really, Israel's dream is to get as much as possible of the West Bank and then maybe give a field of two to, to Jordan or whatever. Palestinians also want basically more of pre-67. But there is precisely the opposite argument, I think, for the one-state solution, which is that not, not, that not only it's not non-realistic, but it is already a fact. On the contrary, what we have now is de facto one big binational state with the problem that it has its inner apartheid and so on and so on. Why not try to simply democratize giving the uh, Palestinians all the rights and so on and so on? I claim, unfortunately, that, okay, probably it will not happen, but maybe, just maybe, that would have worked. Again, the argument is that it's a fact. It's not a utopia. What we have now there is de facto a binational state dominated by Israel, but it is a binational state. Maybe it's a utopia, but... but I mean, actually, I think it's even worse than that. I think you're actually justifying what you're saying here because, um, you know, Bush and Blair, you know, did a nation building, I think. I don't, know how you, I don't know how you build a nation, but maybe state building. Hmm? But that's what you're doing right now. How, how can you say do state building like George Bush? And, but this is exactly... Oh, wait a minute. Not every building is uh, <laughs> George Bush state building. On the contrary, it goes to my Hegelian convictions. One of the things, and this goes with that alienation topic, no? I'm getting a little bit tired of this. My good friend, Alain Badiou, staff of withdraw from the state and, you know, subtract, don't get your hands dirty and so on. What if time 
has come to rethink this a little bit and no longer be afraid of state power but get as much as you can of it and simply use it in a different way. I don't buy this simplistic logic. The moment you grab the state power, you become like your enemy, you know. And you, no, 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 I don't, I don't buy this. So yeah, again, when you say yeah. state building, first, I don't think the Americans are even really doing it. Do you no, think they are really doing this? Space, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, let's go. In Gaza, they, are, they created just a big concentration at, at, camp. At there the is no, all, if anything, they are destroying the Palestinian Slavoj, state. At the end of all liberal democratic conferences, the leader of the Lib Dems tells the members, go out and prepare for government. Now Zizek tells us, go out and prepare for taking the states. Thank you very much. It was an excellent <laughs>